Um, so allow me uh, to introduce, um, uh, I'm so pleased to introduce F FTC Commissioner Terrell McSweeney, um, who's going to be providing some keynote remarks. Um, as these panel discussions have made clear, antitrust and competition policy touches many areas of our lives and many areas of government and policy. As we at Equitable Growth have explored the issue of antitrust, we were thrilled to have her expertise and her encouragement to bring us all here today to have this conversation and um, to tee these up, especially as middle class issues. Um, Commissioner McSweeney has been working on middle class issues for a long time from a variety of posts across government, including executive, legislative, and regulatory. From her post at FTC, Commissioner McSweeney is playing an important role in bringing this focus into antitrust. She was confirmed in April of 2014, and prior to joining the commission, she served as chief counsel for competition policy and intergovernmental, intergovernmental relations for the Department of Justice's Antitrust Division. Prior to that, she was Deputy Assistant to the President and Domestic Policy Advisor to the Vice President, advising Pre President Obama and Vice President Biden on policy in a variety of areas, including healthcare, innovation, intellectual property, energy, education, women's rights, criminal justice, and domestic violence. In particular, um, she coordinated the White House's Middle Class Task Force, which was an initiative to create policies targeting the, the rising, raising living standards for the middle class families, which is headed by Vice President Biden, which is where I first met her. Um, and of course, she knows this building um, very well as well. Um, before joining the administration, um, Commissioner McSweeney was Senator Joe Biden's Deputy Chief of Staff and Policy Director, as well as serving as counsel on the Senate Judiciary Community, Committee. Uh, said that too fast. At any rate, welcome back, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that uh, really kind introduction. Um, it is wonderful to be back in the Dirksen building. Does the sound okay? I feel like it's funny. Um, it's weird and echoey, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I really appreciate um, the leadership that uh, that Heather is taking on, on this set of really interesting policy issues and that um, the Center for Equitable Growth is taking as well. It's, it's absolutely terrific to have this dialogue this morning. Um, before I get started, I'm going to give you the standard disclaimer uh, that we use at the Federal Trade Commission, which is that today I'm going to uh, give you my own views. They're not necessarily the views of the Federal Trade Commission or any other uh, commissioner. Um, so buckle up, it's about to get wild. No, I'm just kidding, actually. Uh, this is an antitrust conference, so settle down <laughs> um, or get breakfast. Um, uh, you know, we, we've heard this morning um, really uh, a number of perspectives that I think are, are uh, important, and I'm delighted. Is it feedback? Yeah, okay. Is that helping? No. Sorry about the audio. Is everybody hearing me okay? Okay. Um, uh, I've been delighted to, to get a chance to spend a little time with former colleagues, Marty and Fiona as well, uh, who have been uh, wonderful to work with in both the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission. And, you know, I think They've surfaced a number of the issues that are really important here. Uh, we're talking about the relationship between antitrust, competition, growth, and inequality. And there's absolutely no question that these are incredibly important and timely issues. I'll note that this is not just a dialogue that's taking place in the United States, that it's actually a, a global conversation uh, at the moment. And I wanted to include that reminder because I think it's important for us to remember that in the US, since we've had antitrust law for over 100 years, uh, economies and policymakers and enforcers around the world pay attention to our thinking and our work in this area. So we need to bear that in mind as we think about the right approaches and, and how to approach antitrust enforcement in the 21st century. You know, last year, the Wall Street Journal reported a growing number of industries in the US are dominated by a shrinking number of companies. And we've discussed some of those trends this morning. We've also noted the fact that earlier this year, President Obama signed an executive order directing executive agencies to take steps to promote competition within their areas of responsibility. 
And that order, importantly, was also accompanied by a report from the Council of Economic Advisors, which noted indicators suggesting increasing concentration across a number of industries and de decreasing business and labor dynamism. Now, as we've been reviewing, the links between these trends are not fully understood yet. It may also be the case that rising economic rents and their shift away from labor and towards capital could be a factor in rising income inequality in the US. In a recent paper, Jason Furman and Peter Orzag suggested that consolidation may be contributing to the changing distribution of, of capital returns in the United States. So there's undoubtedly still a lot of work to be done in order to better understand these trends, how they fit together, whether they fit together, and I believe there's growing consensus that suggested uh, at least a troubling decrease in competition. It's well established that competition benefits consumers via lower prices, greater quality, greater innovation. Innovation in turn leads to productivity growth and better living standards. And in labor markets, competition to attract and retain workers also leads to higher wages. So it's worrisome when we see indicators of declining competition. Against this backdrop, the role antitrust plays in maintaining competitive markets has become quite appropriately an important topic of debate. Ironically, antitrust enforcers do not have a monopoly on competition policy. I want to build on some of the points that John and Fiona uh, and Marty have been making. I think that's why the president's executive order encouraging agencies across the federal government to consider actions they can take within their authority to promote competition is important. And in my view, I hope the next administration continues and builds on that policy. Today, though, I'm going to focus my remarks on the role of antitrust enforcers in this environment and the kinds of changes I think we should think about making in going about our mission. First, let me say there is a great deal that antitrust does extremely well today. Over the last seven years, US enforcers have challenged a larger proportion of merger transactions than in the previous two decades. And it has been a great privilege to serve with the talented and dedicated lawyers and economists both at the Commission and at the Department of Justice. But there are some areas of antitrust, uh, of the antitrust enterprise um, that, to be quite candid, could use a little bit of work. Some of, our, uh, some of our tools um, we need to use more often, and some uh, changes that we need to make actually require congressional action. So I'm happy to see a number of congressional staff in the audience today. First, I think we have to enforce effectively. Second, we must continue to protect opportunity and advocate for competition, both at the local level, the state level, and nationally. Third, we must eliminate barriers to effective antitrust enforcement, including antiquated federal immunities and protectionist state laws. And finally, we must continually seek to improve our understanding of markets, economics, and theories, uh, and the theories underlying antitrust enforcement. That includes subjecting to critical scrutiny even the conventional wisdom of antitrust. So effective enforcement. Over the past several decades, there have been an increased emphasis on avoiding false positives in antitrust, that is, avoiding bringing cases where we may turn out to be wrong. Some suggest that we've developed a bit of a preoccupation with false positives in modern antitrust law, and in, as a result, in close cases, there is un, if there is uncertainty about the future, the thinking goes, it is better to err on the side of letting the market tend to itself. These commenter, commenters believe that the intervention might threaten potentially efficient mergers or conduct. I don't subscribe to that line of thinking. There will uh, uh, usually be some uncertainty about the future. It is, after all, the future. The goal of each case should be to consider the best available relevant economic evidence and make the decision that leads to the best results for consumers and competition. That means a willingness to accept the occasional false positive. Congress certainly understood this when it drafted the Clayton Act in 1914 to prohibit agreements or business practices where their effect may be to substantially lessen competition. As the Supreme Court held in Brown Shoe, Congress used the words may be to indicate that its concern was with probabilities, not certainties. Forward-looking antitrust enforcement is as important and necessary today as it was in 1914. Both the Supreme Court and the Horizontal Merger Guidelines counsel strongly against inaction when assessing the future effects of, merge, of a merger that will produce a high level of market concentration. 
In fact, they set the default to action on the part of the antitrust agencies by declaring such mergers presumptively unlawful. There are also those who insist that there is no place in modern antitrust for the presumptions endorsed by the Supreme Court in Philadelphia National Bank and set forth in the guidelines. The best way to assess these criticisms is to ask whether the application of the presumption is yielding bad results. The available data suggests that US enforcers rarely block pro-competitive mergers. Indeed, evidence suggests that the conventional wisdom that mergers generally tend to lead to efficiency gains may itself be suspect. Recent research suggests that mergers frequently fail to deliver their promised efficiency gains. And in a recent interview, Judge Richard Posner, himself a leading figure in the ascension of the Chicago School, which has had such a big impact on antitrust, observed that it's very unclear that mergers are primarily about increasing efficiency. Other critics of modern antitrust uh, enforcement argue that antitrust law and competition enforcers simply cannot keep pace with change in dynamic high-tech markets, and therefore we should never intervene in them. In these markets, they argue, even well-intentioned enforcement may do more harm than good. I believe that there is a broad international consensus, however, among enforcers, that we should play a vital role in protecting competition in high-tech digital markets. Uh, by preserving the process for innovation and keeping markets open for innovators, especially attacking barriers to entry. Competition enforcers should not turn a blind eye towards anti-competitive behavior in high-tech markets simply because we cannot predict the future with certainty. When we review mergers, horizontal mergers particularly, we must use all of the tools in our toolbox to assess the potential anti-competitive effects of them. This requires not just an analysis of price effects, but also how a merger impacts quality and innovation. Enforcers should consider all the available economic evidence, and now econometric models and merger simulations are very useful, but so are party documents and declarations by industry par participants that shed light on how the market operates. While sophisticated quantitative tools are helpful, thank you, Marta, Marty, Fiona, John, for your various work in this area. We do rely on the economists in our enforcement mission. It's very helpful, especially when there's adequate data available. I think it's important for enforcers to continue to be mindful of the qualitative evidence, like contemporaneous party documents, that may sometimes be the best available evidence of a transaction's likely anti-competitive effect. Antitrust enforcers also should not abandon coordinated effects theories. Following the 1992 horizontal merger guidelines, unilateral effects analysis has overtaken coordinated effects as the predominant theory on which US antitrust agencies challenge mergers. Perhaps one reason for this is that econometric techniques for predicting unilateral effects have developed considerably over time, and the guidelines now devote additional attention to them. While that may be true, coordinated effects analysis remains a valuable tool for enforcers in protecting consumers. It can be difficult in some cases to predict the precise point at which market, uh, market vulnerable to coordinated conduct will reach a tipping point when coordination is more likely to occur. And once a concentrated market does reach a tipping point, there is little antitrust enforcers can do to remedy conscious parallelism and other forms of tacit coordination. And that's why even though it requires prediction, when confronted with markets that are highly concentrated and vulnerable to coordinated conduct, enforcers shouldn't hesitate to act when factors that, that are likely to increase the risk of coordination are present. In recent years, enforcers have also had to demonstrate a willingness to challenge anti-competitive mergers. In the FTC's uh, recent victories blocking the proposed mergers between Cisco and US Foods and Staples and Office Depot, the merging parties offered potential fixes that the FTC rejected after a careful analysis determined the proposed fixes were inadequate to preserve the competition that would be lost in the market. These cases demonstrate that enforcers should not shy away from, as we say, litigating the fix, where we believe it is appropriate to safeguard post-merger competition. The courts in both of these cases also reaffirm the long-standing and widely accepted role that market concentration presumption plays in merger analysis. The guidelines establish a presumption of market power for mergers that cause a significant increase in concentration and result in highly concentrated markets. And moreover, 
the agencies and the courts continue to appropriately be skeptical of emerging parties' claimed efficiencies where the evidence demonstrates that efficiencies are speculative, not merger-specific, and unlikely to be passed on to consumers. Of course, I want to note a part of our discussion this morning that agencies are not always successful. We don't always prevail in merger challenges. Uh, this is more true for the FTC recently than DOJ, as Fiona pointed out. And I want to explain that it's still worth taking the risk, even if you're not going to be successful in the challenge. For example, the commission challenged the merger between the second and third largest sterilization companies in the world um, a couple of years ago. And we allege that the merger would have prevented important innovations in that marketplace. Unfortunately, we lost the case, and I disagreed with the court's ruling, but I think it shows an important uh, thing, which is that the FTC is willing to take innovation seriously and proceed on a merger challenge on an innovation theory. It's also important, as enforcers, that we enforce effectively when we identify anti-competitive conduct. So moving on from mergers and into the conduct space, I think the FTC's recent track record is actually relatively strong. For example, for nearly two decades, the FTC has worked to stop anti-competitive reverse payment settlements where a drug company pays potential generic rival to drop its patent challenge and delay entering the market. The FTC's efforts met with considerable and sustained resistance from many in the industry, but in 2013, the FTC won a major victory at the Supreme Court in the activist case. Following the activist decision, the number of reverse payment settlements has actually decreased, which is a promising trend. And uh, the FTC remains a vigorous enforcer. Last year, the FTC secured a $1.2 billion settlement in FTC versus Cephalon related to anti-competitive anti reverse payments. And earlier this year, the FTC filed suit against Indo and generic firms for entering into illegal reverse payment agreements to delay entry of generic versions of two drugs. Those cases are ongoing. I do think it would be helpful uh, to clarify that all pay-for-delay deals are presumptively illegal, and there is actually bipartisan legislation uh, from Senator Klobuchar and Grassley that would uh, do so that is pending in the Senate. While the FTC must continue to aggressively use its antitrust authority to prevent anti-competitive conduct and mergers that keep drug prices high, there are limits to what antitrust enforcers can do to counter high drug prices absent evidence of anti-competitive conduct. So I just want to underscore the fact that there are some areas where antitrust can be a useful tool and others, as was discussed on the previous panel, that are broader policy issues that require a, a broader solution. Conduct cases can prove especially challenging for enforcement agencies, and I think the previous panel really pointed out some of the risks and, and the uncertainty of this endeavor, and also the fear sometimes of, pre, of creating case law that, um, that is, in our view, unhelpful. Oftentimes, uh, there's no case law directly on point, and sometimes the cases themselves require substantial time, resources, and energy to prosecute. Though these types of cases do take a great deal of resources by the agencies and are not easy to win, I still believe that they are worth bringing. Competition enforcers also have a role to play in, it, in advocating for competition at the state and local level. Sometimes this takes the form of advocating on behalf of competition introduced by new entrants, but it can also mean safeguarding economic opportunity by advocating against prescriptive occupational licensing regimes. Take, for example, state occupational licensing laws. A White House report found that the share of workers subject to state licensing laws has grown fivefold since the 1950s. There can be valid quality health and safety reasons, of course, for imposing licensing requirements on professions. But licensing laws can also reduce competition, harm consumers, and heighten income inequality by shifting resources from workers with lower income and fewer skills to those with higher income and skills. The FTC has focused its, its advocacy on commenting on regulations that may unduly restrict competition in certain fields, and especially when the licensing boards themselves are controlled by active market participants with the incentives to exclude others. The FTC has also taken enforcement action when these practices eliminate competition. And in general, I believe it will continue to be important for federal antitrust enforcers to express concern about state laws that thwart competition. 
The FTC has won two important Supreme Court victories in the last few years, clarifying the scope of the state action antitrust immunity, which uh, can be an unhelpful uh, way to protect anti-competitive conduct, both in North Carolina State Board of Dental Examiners and in Phoebe Putney. And I think we need to actually continue and increase efforts uh, aimed at, at these potentially anti-competitive um, anti laws. Unfortunately, uh, it's particularly true in healthcare at the moment. For example, we continue to advocate against certificates of public advantage, or COPAs, cooperative agreements, and other state legislation granting broad antitrust immunity to healthcare providers. These laws, no matter how well-intentioned, are unlikely to replicate the significant benefit of competition in, the, in local markets. And indeed, you know, Unfortunately, I think Marty noted, noted this, especially this morning, we see a, a growth in this kind of law that really um, can undermine competition, especially in healthcare uh, markets, and um, really could have a long-term consequence that is, is, uh, makes it very difficult for uh, creating a structure that, that becomes competitive again. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about some of the antiquated federal immunities that are still on the books uh, and make a plea to some of you that have the authority to work on changing them to, uh, to work on those, those um, laws. You know, it's, it's something that we don't talk about a lot, but I think it's worth addressing, um, especially since we're, we're here on the Hill. Antiquated federal immunities are really a barrier to effective antitrust enforcement in a lot of sectors. The McCarran-Ferguson Act, for example, exempts the business of insurance from the reach of antitrust laws. Now, Congress passed McCarran-Ferguson more than 70 years ago, and at that time, the concern was that antitrust might preempt state regulation. But this concern makes little sense today. McCarran-Ferguson is just one of many industry-specific exemptions that carves out, carves out antitrust laws. Um, these exemptions and immunities may have made sense when they were created. Uh, especially if the industries were closely regulated. But many of the exemptions have held over despite deregulation in, of the underlying industries, including freight rail, common carrier activity, and agriculture. And it leads to gaps in antitrust enforcement. For example, the rail carrier mergers are uh, exempt from antitrust law fa um, falling solely within the jurisdiction of the Surface Transportation Board. And in the 1980s, the STB actively encouraged rail ca carriers to merge in order to rationalize excess capacity. So the number of major rail ca carriers in the United States fell from over 40 to just seven between 1980 and 2000. And in the late 1990s, the STP approved mergers that reduced the number of major rail carriers from three to two in the Western and Eastern United States. It's been mentioned also several times this morning that every uh, government body you know, needs to manage its resources wisely, but that in fact, maybe we are asking the antitrust enforcement agencies to do uh, more with less, and I think that's probably true. We need to provide adequate resources to the enforcement agencies. If you think about it, um, uh, antitrust litigation, as we've been discussing, is an expensive undertaking. And uh, we've also seen a rise in global M&A activity, surpassing $5 trillion for the first time ever last year. Uh, we haven't seen the corresponding increases in budget for the enforcement agencies, although the administration did propose an increase in funding of the FTC and antitrust division by 10%. I think that's a good first step, but certainly uh, more resources are needed for the agencies. Finally, I think it's important for us to continue to develop frameworks that keep pace with our changing economy. You know, the FTC has given, has given us this authority from its inception to study trends in the marketplace in order to develop its expertise as our markets evolve. And this mandate has actually proven crucial to the FTC's ability to keep pace with new technology and the competitive implications of innovations. We conduct workshops, we solicit comments from industry participants and stakeholders. This improves our knowledge base and it adds to the information available to help our enforcement actions, but also to policymakers as well. Uh, this morning, in fact, we've just released our study of uh, patent assertion entities, so it's on our website for those of you following that issue closely. Provide some, I think, helpful recommendations to those of you considering patent reform legislation. 
I think we need to continue to use that tool. Right now, we're studying the effectiveness of our remedies in merger enforcement, and I'm hoping that that study will be out later in the year and that it will inform our practice in that area and help us understand where we are, we are doing a good enough job and where we need to improve our approach. And uh, we've also really uh, been joined in this endeavor of trying to understand trends by researchers and academics who share our goal of protecting competition and making the economy work for all Americans. Professor Quoka's recent study of merger retrospectives, for example, has shifted the conversation about modern merger enforcement. Whereas before, much of the academic literature focused on the theoretical dangers of blocking pro-competitive mergers, Professor Quoka's empirical work found little evidence to support those concerns. And his work suggests that our focus should instead be on the dangers and costs of false negatives. Other recent studies suggested that when few investors own substantial shares of multiple firms in concentrated market, it can lead to higher prices in that market. And I think more research is needed on this topic, uh, which is uh, going to be very important potentially going forward, as Fiona noted. Uh, you know, I think uh, I wanted to just close by adding a couple of ideas for areas of research, uh, because this is a conference about research and some of the work that we need to do in this area. Um, I'll say first, I think vertical issues don't always receive the attention that they should, and I welcome research on potential for uh, the harm arising from vertical conduct. You know, the current vertical merger guidelines were last updated by the agencies in 1984, and they no longer reflect the practice of enforcers or the best analytic frameworks for analyzing vertical issues believe we need to do more work in that area. And second, big data and algorithms are likely to play an increasingly important role in how prices are set in countless markets in coming years. I think we need more research into the competitive implications of these developments, and we need to understand them better and have them inform our enforcement mission. So I'll Lastly, I'll just say that I think it's worth re-examining even those principles and premises that are, are sort of received as the conventional wisdom in antitrust. Many antitrust practitioners subscribe to the notion that a monopolist can only take its monopoly profit once, and so we don't need to worry about tying, for example. And that view was based on a broad uh, application of the single monopoly profit theory, which Professor L. Haig and others have pointed out happens to be wrong in most cases. So just because something is conventional wisdom doesn't mean it's always right. I welcome the Center for Equitable Growth's mission to encourage and support analysis that improves our understanding of antitrust law, opportunity, and income inequality. And I think as we've been discussing this morning, there's plenty of work for us to do in this area. Thank you very much. <laughs>